All right, today is June 25th, 2022. My name is Adolfo Romero, and I'm here on behalf of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida. And today, who do I have the pleasure to be with? I'm Wilma Rogers. And I'm Bill Rogers. Well, pleasure to meet you, Ms. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Wilma Rogers and Mr. Bill Rogers. It is a pleasure being here today. And today, we will be talking a little bit about your organization, how it got started, and a little bit about your lives. Um, so before I begin, can you tell us a little bit about the about yourselves? Uh, where are you from? Where were you born and raised? Just to get that background. Certainly. I'm from Alachua, right here in the city of Alachua, and I was raised here as well, born in Gainesville, Florida, and I've been here most of my life. All right. And I was born in Birmingham, Alabama, and from there I moved to Los Angeles where I live most of my life in the Los Angeles area. All right, so um, moving forward, how did you guys meet or <laughs> how was that journey? Well, this is pretty I interesting, I think. Um, I was at a low point in my <clears> life. <throat> Therefore, one day I saw in the back of a magazine, it was a boot camp and it was to teach children how to birth their dreams, visions, and ideas. And I was like, okay, I think I wanna go. So anyway, I made my travel over, all the way across to the West, to California. That was my first time being on an airplane by myself, going that far. But the things that I was facing actually propelled me to take a risk. So I went out there and it was a spiritual boot camp. And when I say spiritual, it was just a place to, for me to find myself and find my reconnection with my faith, which is God. And so while there, I met the resort manager. But before meeting the resort manager, there was a storm. And I could not find anyone, a charter, bus, van, taxi, cab, to take me to the resort, which is 25 miles up a mountain. They said, everyone said, ma'am, we cannot take you up this mountain in the night. They said, I found one gentleman who said, well, I'll be able to come back in the morning to pick you up and take you up to the mountain. So... He helped me to find a hotel down at the base of the mountain. That next morning, we took the trip to the mountain and I went through this, the, the, the boot camp. I went through the sessions that we had and actually I had a chance to meet Bernice King as well. She was actually involved in participating in this boot camp. So I was among people that at a, who were at a certain caliber that I had never been around. And I was like, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but I was there to, to reconnect with God, to find my purpose and to move forward. So the next morning, a gentleman came to the cabin to pick me up. And that gentleman was Mr. Rogers mm -hmm. and he was the resort manager. And he said, we know, he said, I normally don't pick up guests, but because it snowed, we want to take care of our guests and to make sure everyone makes it to the conference center. Okay. Properly without any complications. And so before getting in to the Jeep that he was picking me up in, he didn't look at me, but he said, I see wisdom across your head. And I said, I know that sounds strange, but he did. But I was so grateful because that night before I prayed and I said, Lord, help me to pass these tests because I'm here for a purpose and I want to pass the test. So when he said, I see wisdom across your forehead, I was like, okay, prayers are answered. And so anyway, I, after the end of that particular uh, season of, of being up there on the mountain, I got back to Florida. I flew back to Florida and two weeks later, he came across my mind. And I called back up there and to thank him. I said, thank you for the word that you spoke to me. And he said, wow, normally when people call back, they have a complaint. <laughs> and he said, so this is different. 
I said, well, I wanted to tell you thank you because I was going through a difficult time in my life. And he said, wow, you look like you had it all together. I said, well, maybe one day I'll tell you about all of that. And so from that point, we became friends. And after two years, this man has a lot of wisdom that he has helped me and still continues to help me. And so we became very good friends. And after two years, he asked me to marry him. Wow. Okay. And we would talk on the phone every night except one night. I'm not sure what, what caused that. But um, one night we did not talk out of those two years. So as you can imagine, we grew to, to know one another and to um, have a connection there. Well, wow, wow, wonderful story. <laughs> you don't hear those, those type yeah, of stories yeah. anymore around. No. I asked her, I said, where are you from? She said, a, a lot of I tried to look up the mountain. <laughs> Her is, it's like, you know, the mountain I was on was like uh, 6,000 feet above Palm Springs. And I was a resort manager. So people just didn't show up there, just showing up. You know, you had to go to the mountain for a purpose. I mean, there's a town of Idlewild there, which is beautiful. Yes, but, it is. Uh, the resort set in a valley. And it was the old Ponderosa site where they filmed Bonanza. And the people who bought it, they chose me to be the manager of it. Mm -hmm. So so I was really on the old Ponderosa movie site, the Southern California site where they shot Bonanza at. Wow. So 125, 21 acres. 121 acres. Yeah. Wow. So it was pretty interesting. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful country. Only time it got ugly was when the forest fires showed up for, okay. for the Santa Ana winds, which were fierce. Wow. Nothing like that. Hurricanes have nothing on the Santa Ana winds, mm. believe me. I heard stories from Palm Springs that the wind uh, stripped the paint off people's cars from the sand wow. blasting coming across the desert. The Sonora Desert, and wow. you know the wind blows so hard until the sand mixed with wind creates a, a sanding effect. So I said, I don't want to be in it like that. You know, I it's, I've seen it pull up a whole golf course on the mountain because we wow. had a golf course there. Wow. You know, but. Okay, uh, how did you guys end up here in Alachua? Um, uh, well, how did that? Well, we decided versus her with the two uh, kids, Kevin and Rachel, and her children here, we decided California wouldn't be the tight transitioning place. So I had to make the sacrifice and come here, you know. Right. Because, you know, California's kind of like a different, it's a whole different uh, theme for, for young people yeah. and older people. You have to really, the traffic, congest people, and just, different cultures, you know, which not saying they couldn't have, they couldn't have not been injected into that, but, you know, uh, just overall change. So we decided to just settle here. Okay. More, more relaxed. And All right. Uh, Mrs. Rogers, I have a question. Um, so you're, you've been in this community all your life, right? If I'm not mistaken, in Alachua and uh, you've, you've been um, living here your entire life. Can you tell us a little bit about where you grew up and how was that experience growing up in Alachua? Sure. I grew up about maybe a mile from here. Oh, okay. And that experience was great. And my, I have very supportive parents. Uh, I did lose my father February 18th of this year, um, but he left a lot of golden nuggets with me. And I'm very proud to, to say Woman Brown is my father. So my mother, who still lives here, when we were growing up, actually, they supported me with community events. We would have block parties. And it's not your typical block parties of what you think about. Mm -hmm. We would connect with the city of Alachua, and they would block off the streets for us. And we would have a, a fashion show. We would have a drawing contest. We would have volleyball. We would have games in our neighbor's yard. Her name is Miss Joanna Jackson, who lived to be, I think, 100 years old. Wow. We uh, lost her as well. But we had very good neighbors. That's when neighbors took care of one another's children. And it was not a problem. 
And it's like, if you were a child in that neighborhood, you had many mothers and many fathers. And uh, I kind of missed that, but I did gain from that. So my experience growing up was really good. It's like I started out doing events as a young child and it was just something that I internally loved to do. And so I had parents who would help me with the finances. We had local um, merchants here who would donate um, hot dogs and hot dog buns and all the fixings and, and that type of thing. We had supported uh, support with um, advertisement and my father, he would build props and he would build um, fashion show runways and we actually placed them in the middle of the street. And um, we had um, the local DJ who was around my age, small, you know, at that time, probably at, I remember starting having DJs probably around the age of 10 when I say having DJs, hiring someone to actually come in and play the music for us to have some type of entertainment. Um, but it was a place that um, it just wasn't something that I did alone. It was a community effort and it was something that we enjoyed and it was a safe place that we could uh, have. And um, I'm, I'm just very happy that we had that opportunity to do such things. And now that it's overflowed, it overflowed into what we do now here in the community. And um, I was able to take that experience and bring it to now. Okay, no, um, I wanted to find out a little bit more about your father. Like, it seems like back in the day, there was a lot of community that was built upon, uh, you know, the elders building upon it. And up to today, I'm not sure how that has changed, but can you tell me a little bit about your father and what did he do? Did, did he live all his entire life in Alatra? He was actually, my father, Wilman Brown, he was actually born in Haynesworth, Florida, which is near La Crosse. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was born 1925 on August 9th. And I remember my father as, as a good man. Um, he loved his family. He provided for his family, um, not only for his family, but he also, he would, in the neighborhood, after he, he worked with um, MMM M M Parish Construction Company. And after his job working outside all day, he would still find time to go to a neighbor's house and repair a screen door, a window, um, anything with wood that needed a nail in it. He would find time to go and fix and prepare other people's homes, especially um, widows. He would do that because he, he grew up, he would tell me, he said, he would say, um, Jeannie, and that was my nickname. He said, Jeannie, I grew up hard. He said, I got my first pair of shoes at the age of nine. <laughs> and he said, when his father brought the shoes home, they were too small. But his, his father said, I'll take them back and get you the proper size. And he said, no, no, I want to keep these. So he kept those shoes. Mm -hmm. And can you imagine age of nine having a first pair of shoes and, and farming? They grew up on a farm. And uh, my, my grandfather was a sharecropper. And so he had a heart of compassion for people. I'm not kidding. Even this may be a little funny story. I know it's going out there worldwide, but some of the people can relate to this. When we were small and it was time we had to be chastised by our parents and my mom she was the one who chastised us okay and my dad he would intervene he said rose don't do it this time don't chastise him this time i was like yes yes you know we were so happy but he was compassionate in, in many ways and that was one of them that i really appreciate um my dad um he just wanted to make sure he didn't want to see anyone in pain that okay. was his thing. He wanted to help, even with my um, my my cousins. He stepped in, and I learned some things from my cousins once my father passed away. Um, they shared that when my father was in the Navy, he was in the Navy, and he would send home his check to one of his family members wow. who had children. He would, and I didn't know that, but he actually did that. And one of the children who's now an adult, he shared that with me. 
Wow. And I was like, wow, you know, I was happy he did share it with me because my dad was not one to boast or talk about what he did at all. Wow. And um, so he also went to Pearl Harbor after the bombing. He was over there for a while and he would share some of the stories um, with us over there. During that time, he did tell us that he was not able to share the barracks with white men. Mm -hmm. They had separate barracks, but they were expected to fight together. So, mm -hmm. but certainly my father being the type of man who he was, if any person of any race needed assistance, he would assist them. He didn't have that type of heart. He had a good heart. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, you did mention he went, he went to World War II, right? He was a veteran from World War II. Yes, and he was in yeah. World War II. As a Navy wow. CB. Yes, as a Navy CB. Wow. Yes, okay, yes. that's impressive. We don't hear uh, about uh, those folks anymore. You know, it's kind of hard, right. you know. So that's, that's wonderful true. that you're able to share with us. Uh, yeah. Very fast, too. Mm -hmm. Um, so tell me about yourself, uh, Mr. Bill. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about where you grew up, your father, mother, what did they oh, do? I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, okay. then uh, right after I turned about age five, we moved to Montgomery. Uh, my, my father worked in the coal mines. And from Birmingham, we moved to Montgomery, Alabama. Mm -hmm. And during that time uh, was that time of growing up for me was the civil rights movement. So I, I lived two blocks away from Martin Luther King's church. And my grandmother lived right around the corner from Martin Luther King's house. So I had an interesting world. You know, we were given boundaries as young kids of what not to do, how to navigate the times. My mother would always tell us, my father was always busy working. But she would always tell us, uh, don't pay attention to the, the climate of the level of hatred. Always look at the good in it and never, never participate on the wrong side of it because uh, it was tremendous, tremendous times, you know, uh, for, for, for you being a person of color. You know, everything was like, Real negative. The negative was way manners. I mean, you got a lot of manners now, but in my day growing up, it was way below zero, you know, uh, because because certain certain rights that were being uh, expressed, voting rights, you know, even from the simple thing as Rosa Park riding on a bus. I I I grew up on that. I I would go to that corner where all of that take place. And as a matter of fact, where the, where the Rosa Park Museum is now, it's where I got my first job in a theater there. Mm. And it was the Empire Theater, but they tore it down and built the Rosa Park Museum. And my aunt, she was the director there mm. from, from its start until recently, about five years ago. She, she, uh, she was the director at the museum. So when we took the kids mm -hmm. and she met the children on our historic tour that we took to Montgomery. She was like in tears because yes. wow. she saw, I guess she saw the good and me and Wilma on how my, my life being affected growing up in that area didn't re, uh, reflect negative as my upbringing, as, as I grew to be a man, it didn't scar me where I would have a not so good outlook on life, you know, mm -hmm. but I would continue to try to help uh, effect change in the lives of others, which, which this is all about. Mm -hmm. My theory in life, if everyone would just stop and think and do what they could do in life to help make someone else else's day better, the whole place would be fixed. And that's a simple fix right there. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of money. Uh, the U.S. is one of the most wealthiest places on the planet. And I, I do think money is not the problem. It's the heart of man which is actually the problem. I think people actually moved away from the 
act of really loving one another. Understanding the word love, that's one of the greatest gifts that we've been left with, is to love one another. And that's the simple fix right there. It has to start, and when it comes to the home and the way young people are today, that fixes, it has to start with the foundation of the, of the home. Parents have to be reprogrammed uh, and take up their role of managing their home, managing their children. Uh, I know everybody say they are busy, but sometimes you've got to make sacrifices and, and put down some of the electronics. The electronics are still in a lot of time, valuable time that you could you can regain. I'm not against electronics, but I think if if things were done in balance and understanding what you're listening to nowadays, there's a lot of information, so you have to you have to really use wisdom when it comes to information nowadays. Uh, everything sounds right, it's not right. Everything sounds bad, it's not bad. So you have to you have to really ponder what I do. I ask God, I say, God, what would you have me to think about that? And, and the reason I say that, because I look at the stories of George Washington Carver, how he went to the land and asked God, what do I do with this soil? And he came up with so many products. And, and the thing when we went to Booker T. Washington's home and Tuskegee, we learned that he had the first modern home in the mm. South with plumbing and electricity. Yeah. Presidents used to come there to marvel at his home that they had. And when most of the students went there to get an education at Tuskegee Institute, they would, they would actually go there to learn how to make brick and build the university. Wow. And so we learned all these things about these two great men, uh, Booker T. Washington and George Washington Carver, right in my neighborhood, you know, and I, I was uh, amazed at the stories. So long shot all the way around that story is families. <clears throat> my parents did a great job, nine kids, nine kids, all of them. I just have one brother who passed away, but uh, all of them are smart, bright like me. You know, here I consider myself bright. I'm, I'm actually thinking that <laughs> <laughs> I might know. <clears throat> excuse me, I might know something nowadays. And uh, when, if I may say too, and a part of him saying that with confidence is that his mo his mother would always tell him, "You are you are a genius." Oh yeah, yeah. You sure. are a genius. And yeah, and I think when we tell when we see kids, we. We've dealt with a lot of kids here in this community, and some of them were the type of kids that people would say, oh, they're just no good, they're not going to be anything. But you have to see the good and bad and all of it. Now, when you get a, a child that, that's really on edge, you might have to step away from them, tell the parent, maybe, maybe they need to get some help in another area of anger management or something, because our program really didn't deal with that. But we dealt with the child who wanted to actually have a chance. If they work with us, we'll work with them. That's what it would be. But and, and the settings that we had, we didn't have a lot of time to do discipline, you know, because there were usually 30 other kids there that want to learn something. So we spent that hour trying to discipline. Uh, we, we would lose out on a lot of children that really wanted to get the information that we actually had for them that day so yes and one thing we that we did do as well when we would talk to the parent who may have had a child who needed some extra help mm -hmm. we would provide them with resources mm -hmm. and that way they could reach out and because sometimes when a parent they they recognize that that student or the, their child needs some more um, help, or, you know, to improve, to get better. Sometimes they just don't know where to go or who to turn to. Right. So when we provide them with the resources, we did hand them some type of tool to be able to get the child help because we care. We do care about children. 
Um, and so that's pretty much what we would do when we did run into a problem with a child who needed some extra assistance. It's yeah. not the child that the child is bad. It's just that something, the child encounters something that causes him or her to have that type of behavior. And so someone else, a professional, has to get help that child get to the bottom of it okay. and to resolve it. Right. Right. And, All right. and, and I migrated from the uh, South to escape all of the pain and suffering of society that was yes. trying to be inflicted upon uh, one's thinking, you know, because I always knew the truth that you don't really dislike me, you really won't, you don't understand me, you haven't taken the time to know who I am or ask the question, how can I help you today? Or my name is Joe. Hey, I'm Sally. You know, simple questions. You know, people don't didn't take the time to understand and know each other. Mr. Rogers, I see the wisdom where stems from now that I'm getting to know you a little bit more and uh, all the history that you've been uh, sharing with us. I think um, the way that we're turning around the conversation, segueing now to the next uh, uh, conversation, which would be the organization. Uh, the amazing organization maps that you've been uh, that you uh, created. Can you tell us talk a little bit about that and how it came about, and tell us what MAP stands for? Sure, um, MAP stands for Music and Arts Program for Youth, and we kind of tabled the idea for about two years because by him coming from Montgomery in Alabama and seeing the different things, the, the disadvantages that were going on and that he experienced. And I myself having a, a love for this community and wanted to see youth around this area to have a chance to have some type of outlet to improve their lives. Um, so therefore, we talked about it. What can we do to move forward to help? You know, not just talk about it, but what can we actually put into action? and into motion. And so what we came up with was he has the musical, technical gifts and a father figure. And I myself, I said, well, I can teach them art, teach them how to read, um, help them with their skills. So that's how we came up with music and arts program, meaning we're not stopping at just music and arts. Whatever the need is, it comes up under program. Yes. So music and art program for you. And so we made an appointment to go to the city of Alachua to talk and to have that discussion, to tell them our, our, our ideas. We took the manual, we took the layout, uh, we took a, a schedule of events for the program so they can actually get a visual of what we were uh, wanting to do. And so they immediately embraced it and provided us a facility to have our programs in. And we were very grateful. And not only that, they, they also added lunch for the children. So we was like, wow, this is great. You know, we, we, we were thinking about, you know, so many barriers that we may have come across, finances, resources, um, but having this open door really helped us and gave us the confidence to move forward. So that was in 2010. And so we had an open house for mm -hmm. parents and children to come in and to hear our vision and what we wanted to provide for the children at no cost. Because a lot of times parents want their children to be involved in activities. It's just sometimes a money issue, you know, versus are we going to pay this bill or have my child in, in, in this type of musical program? And, and a lot of times, well, we're going to feed the kids. So we wanted to take that burden off of them. And so what we did also is we reached out and obtained some grants, one from the um, Fender Foundation that provided us uh, musical uh, instruments. And, and so we were able to, to acquire keyboards, we were able to acquire um, guitars, and through other um, grants, we were able to acquire the, the reading tablets mm -hmm. and, is it, and the, um, the sweet, drums. Sweet water. Sweet music. water. Yeah, provided um, musical instruments for us. And so it's just, we're really grateful for the tools to be able for children to come in 
and learn and to gain. And so while we were teaching them the musical parts and the, the art, the artistic parts, we, we noticed that there were some kids who were struggling with reading. So how can you move up, move on and move ahead with teaching music and arts and not address the reading problem? Mm -hmm. So then that's when the other program was birthed was read, which mm -hmm. is reading empowers all dreams. That's one of the programs that we have uh, under the MAP umbrella. And so not just us, but we had people to come in that would volunteer from the schools that mm -hmm. would teach the children how to read. And, and we also we had tests, we had um, uh, measurements set in place to actually see the improvements of the child and to be able to help them feel more comfortable in the setting of the music and the art. Mm -hmm. So um, we were happy about that. Uh, uh... Through uh, those 10 years now, going 12 years, uh, 2022, uh, can you tell me some of those challenges, initial challenges that you guys had to face and how did you deal with them? <clears throat> well, the challenges, hmm. Well, having such a passion, <laughs> and maybe it didn't seem like such a challenge because when you really want to overcome and do and to, to accomplish something, you, you do find ways to, to meet the need. So as far as, we also noticed that the children sometimes would come in hungry. So therefore they were not paying us any attention <laughs> because, you know, they were not functioning up to their fullest potential. So what we did was we, we started having fundraisers to provide lunches for the children. Um, so that, that helped um, meet a challenge right there. Um, also, what other challenges that you can think of? I know we've already uh, talked about when, the, when a child had a behavioral problem, um, we, would, we would do our best to address it. But if we could not, then we would have a, a talk with the parent and provide resources. Uh, logistical uh, space. Okay. Space. Uh, as the year has evolved, uh, our programs change. So it, it required different space, space venues. You know, like like the puppet, the puppet. Uh, yeah, uh, the thing is part of read, mm -hmm. but it requires a large space because the puppet houses are a real city that we actually design here, okay. and they just it required larger rooms with more technical stuff, and and volunteers to help with the children because yes. we we couldn't you know volunteers have always been an issue because everybody wants to get paid mm -hmm. <laughs> and no one wants to lend a helping hand which is understandable you know but in order to pay you would have to let something uh we would have to do a call somewhere else we never want to put the costs on the kids or the parents. Exactly. So that's never been an option. Mm -hmm. To to down down um, down trot the the finances to the family. That's that's a, that's, right. that's not a right. no brainer. And many right times there. we sacrificed ourselves. Yeah. You know, we yeah, sacrificed definitely. our own our finances, own which we do not regret. No, because not, not we right see there. the smiles on the children's faces. We see them improving. Yeah. We see them yes. more happier. Um, so that's our reward to yes. see that, that our the funds that we put in, the time that we put in mm -hmm. is really making a difference and it's changing the lives of children. Because sometimes love, it goes back to love. We all need somebody to love us, whether we want to admit it or not. Yeah. We need love. We cannot live without it. Mm -hmm. um, so those challenges, challenges that yeah. we had to make, um, we just, we just pressed in, we leaned in to get the jobs done, even with, um, loading the equipment up and taking it to the facilities and, oh, yeah. and bringing it back. You know, a lot of times it was Bill and I, and also our children, Kevin and Rachel, yeah. uh, they would also lend a helping hand. Even today, they do the very same thing. Yeah. They are still in our lives. They're still in the lives of the children at this program, yes. and they help us. And so we just take our time, and we load every piece, right. and we bring it back. In actuality, <laughs> uh, we never let none of those challenges stop us. Because right. I remember going to the guitar camp with 
12 guitars on the bicycle <laughs> and, the, and the child, uh, one of the little carts that pulled the little kid. Oh, he did. I would load all the, bi- yes. the guitars, which is a lot of them. He it's sure more did. than this. <laughs> and, uh, right. 12 or 13 guitars up on the bicycle wow. carriage. He and did. go to the library. So the crossing kids. highways. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to do what you got to do, you know, That's when, right. you, when you want it to happen, mm-hmm. you know, because others are always depending on you. That's right. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the expansion of uh, MAP and uh, what regions does it cover now and who's in charge of those uh, mm-hmm. areas? Mm-hmm. For MAP, let's see, we started here in Florida, of course, and we also branched out to Montgomery. That's his hometown. Mm-hmm. So we have people stationed there. And when we take the kids to the, the legacy on the legacy tour, that's another one of the programs. When we take the kids to the legacy tour to Montgomery, to the museums and to Tuskegee, we mm-hmm. have people in position to help us there once we get there. Yes. And they also help us with the with uh, presentations and mm-hmm. PowerPoints um, to be able to expand the teachings of, of character development, which which. Um, spills over into the characters of like George Washington Carver, Booker T. Washington. So as they go and learn more about people in those areas who were very impactful, um, we just kind of support that to help them to, to say, hey, acquire, learn to acquire and appreciate these individuals. And these are the type of uh, characteristics that help propel them to success. And you can do the very same thing. Um, right behind us, we, I do see a lot of books. Can you tell me a little bit about the educational material that you teach uh, children? Sure. What we did was, since the pandemic arrived, mm-hmm. um, we still wanted to reach out to kids and be involved in their lives. Mm-hmm. So therefore, we developed My Amazing Kid journals. And like we talked about, um, sometimes uh, being able to pour into the life of a child with positive words, you are a genius, little genius. Genius is actually one of our journals. This is actually the poster, but I'll pull out the journal. Can I get up? Okay. Absolutely. This journal here, My Amazing Kid Journal, Little Genius. And this one is actually dedicated to, let's see here. Just wanna make sure I get it right. In honor of all African-American geniuses in the field of science and technology. It has an affirmation that children can read daily for reprogramming to help them to build confidence and build their self-esteem. Um, For instance, I am beautiful, I am intelligent, I am courageous. My confidence is increasing every day. My actions are intentional and they bring me closer to my goals. So that's just part of the affirmation. And also in each one of these, along with the affirmation, it's a, um, a word match game to build vocabulary and also a reading challenge that's in the book. And it's for them to select um, an African-American from this list and write a paragraph and they'll receive a certificate. I believe the certificate's in the back of this book. Not this one, okay. We've upgraded our book. So there is a little genius book with a certificate in each one of these. Wow. That's... So it's the teaching tool is is in each one of these. Also, it actually provides the children to be able to see themselves on the cover, which builds confidence that they can say, hey, there's someone on this cover that looks like me. And this one is goals. And this book actually helps teachers the children um, to set goals and how to reach them. You know, right now we have a lot of Florida standards, curriculums, everything going on, you know, backfiring, but it all begins with the kids, like getting that courage, getting that confidence to learn, to wanting to learn and to understand their significance, personal significance of who they are, their identity. And I think you guys are doing an amazing work at delivering those deliverables back to the communities, back to the children and giving a voice, you know, representation back to them. Oh, you know, this is this is who you are. This is 
you know, embrace embrace that identity, yeah. self identity, which is very very remarkable. Uh, Thank you so much. I think that's beautiful uh, to put it in other words. Um, moving on uh, with some of the questions, you are a five hundred one c three organization, correct? Nonprofit organization. That's that, correct. Okay, yes. that that is that's great. I'm happy to hear that and the expansion throughout different states, going back to your community, Mr. Bill. Right. And what does that mean to you, going back to your community and being being able to uh, do this work over there. Well, every time I went back, it was like, I was, I've been in awe, you know, because I tell my wife, well, I used to walk these streets when I was a young kid. We used to walk, and we used to walk down through the downtown area because we lived a block away from the state capital. Really, in actuality, we lived maybe a block and a half away, so. And going to school, I would pass it every day, and there was a lot of stuff negative going on. But when I go back now, and I, and I can actually look back and see some of the changes made, and we t if we take a group of kids or a group of people, you know, it's just like I'd be in awe, you know. I'm, I, like we went to the newest museum they have there, the Legacy, mm -hmm. the Legacy Museum. It's like, man, it was like two blocks from where I grew up. And I was wow. Like, and. We were standing on this hill talking. I said, I tell my wife, but well, this used to be Carolina Courts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm standing here right now, and these, and when I just see all the information, it's like, why well, I, I didn't know that was going on here, you know, and I didn't know that that slaves actually walked up through this tunnel right. and the river mm -hmm. here that we we go and visit. Well, they have a big amphitheater on there now, and I'd be like, man, this is like. It's like a deja vu of something that, that I didn't know, the world that I, I didn't know exists. Did my parents talk about all of that? No, they were, they were busy dealing with the times that were in effect then. They were dealing with the climate right in front of us, you know, which were kind of difficult. Right. You know, so it's an unprecedented uh, feeling to actually go back there and see that, you know. And, yes, sir. And when I grow, go with a group of people, I have to, I have to know when to speak and just, because it's, there's so much I can tell them, you know. You know, it's like, when, when they, we took the kids to Martin Luther King's house, I look around the corner, and I said, man, my grand, grandmother's house used to be right over there. And maybe, and, and, and everybody just being, oh, you really used to, I used to play right down this sidewalk in front of his house, you know, oh, wow. ride my bike and skate right down that side, very sidewalk. Wow. But I never did, you know, through the time of history, you never knew the significance of, of, of that era. And one of our good friends right now is Cheyenne Webb. She was in, she, she wrote the book Selma Lord Selma. And she was, Disney turned it into a movie, Selma Lord Selma. You probably heard of it. Hmm. Um, but she's a good friend of ours. She's still in Montgomery doing the type of work we do mm -hmm. with young people. Wow. So her life too was affected in yeah. order and in order to help make a difference even into the day time. Because she was on that march of Bloody Sunday. She was the only child in that march. Really? Bloody Sunday, yeah. Cheyenne Webb, Christburg. Wow, that's yeah. incredible. I, I wish we could take you to our yearly Mississippi Freedom Project trip. Yeah. Uh, we travel throughout the Delta, go to Montgomery, Alabama, and do, oh, wow. you know, the whole yeah, tours so and everything. There, huh? wow. well, we've been there, we've been there. Well, and we're it's actually... Quite, it's quite something else, isn't it? Oh, yes. And we're going back again this year uh, in yeah. July, in the, the next upcoming month. So oh, we'll be wow. up there for seven days interviewing folks. I think doing... everybody should take a, a trip there. Absolutely. I mean, it's like life-bending. Absolutely. It changed my the way that I think I, even about the history, about life itself. I mean, yeah. I'm originally from Chicago, so, oh, yeah. you know, I have a different perspective on like Southern culture, Southern history yeah. that I was never taught. Mm -hmm. And by me going over there, it just like opened my worldview and perspectives about the South. So yeah. wow, something yeah. significant for sure, yes. definitely to be said. Yeah. Um, and also we um, we take the we have an extension over in Georgia where Georgia. we have relatives there yeah. and so the door opened for us to begin 
going over there in 2014, maybe 2014. 2014. And we began taking the children to the trumpet awards. Mm -hmm. And that was at the, the, the grace of um, yeah. the founder. Uh, she opened that door for, for us. And so the children go and they get a chance to see African-Americans receive that trumpet award and to hear their stories because yes. their story sounds like their story. Absolutely. And it's like them hearing that, hey, you came from a place that sounds like me. Yes. So I too can achieve this. I can get there. And so um, in addition to that, the children in times past, they get to walk the red carpet with the stars. So that's also a confidence yes. boost for them to be able to do that. And we're very grateful to Miss Clayton um, and the and the Trumpet Award, the Bounce Trumpet Award Foundation. We are very grateful for them for opening that door because it's been a yes. door that's been open for several years now. And so we get to take children who they they've never seen the tall buildings in, in Atlanta. You know, they get a chance right. to get outside of their own community and yes. neighborhood. And so that's very eye opening for them, and it's a life changing experience for them. And we could not do it without our, our board and, and the, yes. the people who donate to this great cause. Um, so we don't we don't we don't do this alone. No, you know, no, it no, takes absolutely. it takes people uh, takes that people. see what we see and want to support right. these children. Right. Because we were supposed to take the kids to the Kodak Theater this past January. Right. But there was some COVID restrictions going on in California. We had to postpone that oh, trip. Okay. It was getting to be a bit too much for us trying to think out all the logistics for the okay. parents. So we decided not to fly that far with children. Uh, we would have used, we have of course used like a, uh, a more older range, like the ones who are graduating out of high school and into first year of college. We would use because we have a lot of students who have gone on. We have some students that work for NASA now. Wow. And some of them are, you know, they various professions that they went into. Right. And when we see them and hear from them, it's like, man, yeah. is that time flying I like know. that? It's like, wow, what's happening? <laughs> so fast. You know, it's amazing. It's fast, you yeah. Know? But we're happy we were able to be a part of their lives yes. to help them and, and you know, it lets us know Bill and Wilma, keep doing what you're doing. And it's always life changing when yeah. you see it happen. Absolutely. It's life changing. Yeah. That brings me to the next question. What about the parents? Uh, what remarks do you hear from the parents? I mean, the children are getting all this knowledge, you know, skill sets. Uh, what do the parents say? Uh, the parents be on board 100 yeah, percent. Absolutely. Know, the parents want to yeah. go on most of the trips. Too, <laughs> right. We do take, a lot <laughs> we do take them too. Oh, wow. Because yeah. we we encourage parents to be chaperones, mm -hmm. so they can also get uh, the experience that they probably haven't gotten. That's one of our main criteria: is, is parents chaperone your own child because when when a child see their parent interested in what they're interested in. Uh, the success rate for them achieving whatever goal they have is, is more proven to be actual, you know. Okay. They can reach those goals when they see the parents interested in their interests. So. And it's real exciting to see the parent-child interaction yeah. when, when we go visit a museum, when we right. um, sit in the roles of the, the trumpet awards at the mm -hmm. theater. Um, Simple thing as we captured a moment where the parent was tying the bow tie of her son. You know, yeah. those things, they're, to me, they, they are really special. Right. And we were able to capture that on, on, a, on a picture and share that. They, right. they can have that the rest of their lives. You know, it's just moments right. that are created when parents are involved with the children. Okay. Can, can you tell me a little bit about the Top Talent um, event and how, does, uh, how many years have you been doing it and when is the next one, upcoming one? Top Talent Live is something that we really get excited about. Yeah, we yeah. Start, our first one was, I think, in 2019? Yeah, so. 2019. We've had it two years. Okay. Um, when the pandemic came, of course, that kind of changed things for us, but we are talking about having it again pretty soon. Um, 
he's saying 2023. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Top Talent Live provides a platform for children to showcase their talent. A lot of times in this area, we don't have that. We don't have that. So we wanted to create that moment for them. Um, so we partnered with the city of Alachua and they provided the uh, Legacy Center for us, which has a stage and everything, the lighting. And we bring, we bring in, allow the children to sign up. And they actually audition. send, they audition, they send out a video um, to us by email whether they're singing, dancing, clapping their hands, whatever their 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 uh, talent is, they send that to us, and then um, we make the selections. Not just us, but we oh, have yeah. we have a team that uh, reviews these the talents and make the final selections. And then during this particular event, we bring in kids to allow them to learn on the job skills, such as lighting, sound. Sound design, lighting, uh, stage management, and just the overall production. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, like she was saying, the kids actually audition before pre-judging. Mm -hmm. and, and the judges there, they let them know whether or not, our goal is not to turn around any child. So what the, the judges were instructed to do, to give them the points on how to improve for the night of the show. Uh, but we put them all through okay. to the show. Wow. Uh, I don't think we had to turn around. We haven't turned around any. Turn around any, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, talent is talent. That is correct. Yeah, and so we're excited because the children can place on their resumes the type jobs that they were involved in doing this type show. Right. And they can learn it and maybe something they want to go into, you know, as a career. Um, but it introduces them to something new that they've never seen before or had hands-on before. One year, we even had the video production team. Now, that was a hard year because on-job on, on training on video production is not easy. You know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with video production. The lighting could get off, the film stop, tape stop running, you know, camera. Something happened with the setting on the camera, you know. Uh, but they did a pretty good job mm -hmm. with that that year. Absolutely. On, on it. We're very proud of them. <laughs> Great job. We even That's had them, uh, yeah. had a couple of them to, to be VIP hosts. Yes. Where when they brought in, they, they seated the senators, they seated the mayor, they seated uh -huh. commissioners, and they did yeah. a fantastic job. Yeah. Right. And, and they host the show. They host the show. Wow. I forgot about that. <laughs> I mean, they are really like TV hosts. Yes. Wow. They handle it. Yes. They handle the stage, the crowd, mm -hmm. um, how to approach it, how to speak out, you know, be right. vocal. And so it's, it's, it's really it interesting. It's good. It, and Very it thinks, good. yeah. How thanks. to dress. I mean, dress for success. That's true. I mean, that was they, cool. they yeah. did the whole 100 angle of it. And we attributed that success to the Trumpet Awards to Miss Clayton, allowing yes. us to bring the children to that award show, and they saw how it was done. Because when they see it, when you actually see it, you can now do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you can't. You can't do something you can't see. You got to first see it on the inside. Okay. You know, when you see it on the inside, you can do it. And then if you actually see it in person. Oh, you say, oh, that's how it's done. Mm -hmm. I can be that person. So I think opportunity is always a great teaching tool in that aspect. Yes. When you recruit uh, kids, children, uh, what type of children are they from like low income families, middle class, or just all types of walk of life? The program is based on serving children from under-resourced communities, mm -hmm. and we're in that community. However, when children come with an interest to learn, to want to be a part, we do not turn them away. Okay. Yes. Because children are children, and every child should have an opportunity. Um, so it is based on under-resourced uh, communities okay. where yes. children live. Yes, because we've had kids as far away as from Russia. Yes. Whoa. Yeah. 
That's incredible. <laughs> yeah, their parents had to be translators for us. <laughs> right. Right. They moved they moved from Russia they here. They moved from Russia here. And they wanted wow. to be a part. Yeah, and so um their children, show. their English were, was very good, but the wow. parents um, yeah, the they parents. they helped translate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The children helped translate for right. the parent. But it was it was a great great experience great. to have them as a part and, and great artists and musicians. I mean they pick I mean children. You know, all children tend to pick up. They just need someone to help and guide them. Yeah, that so. is correct. Mm -hmm. Are the, most of the kids from this county, like area, like uh, Alachua, or do they come from other uh, neighborhoods, or which areas would you say? Alachua County. Alachua, 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 Alachua County. County, yes. Okay, well, yes. which makes sense. I mean, it's yeah. nearby, so. Close, yeah. They okay. Can come. All right. Um, well, with that said, is there anything else you would like to share with us uh, regarding the organization or the work that you're all doing currently uh, doing? Th during the pandemic, we transitioned to the MAP Cares. Oh, OK. Oh, uh, yes. So Ooh. we actually we actually um, I'll let you go ahead on. Uh, <laughs> yes, we we content. We wanted to continue to serve in our community. And with the pandemic beginning, we started Map Cares, and with the help of some very good donors, they allowed us to purchase gift cards um, from Walmart. Publix, Walmart, Winn Dixie, and so we would have drive-through wow. um, giveaways. Giveaways. We would have these giveaways. We just um, have gift them cards come. for food. Right for food. Yes, for for the families. Yes. And so we enjoy having this uh, giveaway to still serve in our community. Wonderful. That is wonderful. Yeah. So even through the pandemic and everything, oh, yeah. you have, you keep going and growing yeah. and yeah. very resilient. Very, yeah. uh, you're able to adapt quick. And uh, what are the next, uh, what is the next thing that you see within the organization, like the future of the, of the program? Movies. So, Movies. Movies. Are you able to grab that. Ooh. Yes, we wow. have a, a, a very real desire to take this. Well, this. you know what, not to cut you, he Go spoke ahead. it when he came in. He said, what did you say? You said something that was interesting to my ears. You said, we've taken that to the next level. Oh, <laughs> or yes, he did. You remember yeah. what you saw? Uh, I was... <laughs> when you saw that, you yes, said, he did. we've what? taken that. Uh, to the next, next level when you saw the superhero. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's amazing. And I think um, you, you have like even the diversity and inclu inclusiveness inside of it, which yeah. is yeah. The, like the factors. It's just, it's Isn't incredible. It? I think, it, I mean, I, it's wonderful. Like, it looks wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> I yeah. love it. Who's creating the graphics and all that? Do you, do you guys work on the graphics or we, who works on that? We actually have a team. We, okay. we take the concept. The to concept. the team, mm -hmm. um, from colors to the shape of the eyes, the wow. nose, yeah. um, the, the stance, hair. the position, the hair, That's... everything. We take the concept to the team, and they come back with the product. So uh, we are so grateful for our team. And um, the superheroes, they were created from the children who wanted to see kids that look like them in textbooks, on cereal boxes, in the movies. Mm -hmm. And um, these superheroes go around in the community and neighborhood to help those that are in need, yes. especially children. But more to come, more to come more to on come. this. Can you tell me a little bit about what they all represent? They all have their own values yes. or cores. Um, Each one of these uh, superheroes have their own superpower. We have right here, Carlos. Carlos has courage. That's his superpower. We have next Wendy. Wendy's superpower is wisdom. Then we have Omari. Omari's superpower is love. And last but not least is Anali. Anali's superpower is faith. She helps everyone get the job done. So these are superpowers that come to the rescues of individuals in the community, especially to the aid of children. And they are the influencers. They are called the influencers. Yes, that was very important. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yes, and we actually um, have more to come. And that's so. right off the press right there. Yes, this is like 
brand new. Brand, brand new. new. Yeah. Wow. Brand new. Like yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and so we love it. We want to inspire every boy, every girl yes. to do good and to mount up into the realm of success. All right. Uh, final question. Uh, if you could leave a message to the community, what would be the message that you would like to, for the community to know, parents and so forth, the ones viewing this uh, interview? We would like parents and children to know to reach out to us and take part in the music and arts program. And they can log on to map4youth.com. They can also email us at emailmapnow at gmail.com. Just reach out to us and we're here for our children. All right, well, it has been a great pleasure. Mr. Bill, do you have any last uh, comments? No. I'm good. Thank you for having me. Thank us. you. Absolutely. Both. Yes. All right. That will conclude our interview for today. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Thank that you. was wonderful. Learned so much <laughs> incredible work, Miss Rogers. Uh, like, I, I did not even realize we we're going to be speaking about all this, like, the way that we spoke to uh -huh. that level. I, I think it was wonderful. Oh, good. And I'm glad that you could, we came uh, across each other's paths. You know, what are the odds of, you know, just being there? Same time, same place.